Hello! In this lecture, we'll be talking about plagiarism, one of my least favorite things to talk about. So, plagiarism. A few things about it. First, it's a serious academic offense. It's really bad. Right? I cannot stress that enough. So, what is it then? It is the direct copying of someone else's writing and presenting it as your own work. It can be just simply rearranging someone else's sentence into new patterns. It could be cutting and pasting portions of someone else's work without citation or credit. It could be closely paraphrasing someone else's writings. All these are examples of plagiarism. They're not exhaustive. Other things can constitute plagiarism. But the core of it is you're taking someone else's ideas and you're not giving them credit. You're stealing. Right? You're taking someone else's ideas and passing them off as your own. So as a general rule then, when in doubt, cite. If you're not sure, cite. Right? At least then it's clear that there are issues you weren't intending to plagiarize and that you did try and give credit. But even then, you got to be really careful. Even if you cite, you still need to make sure that you're doing it properly. Right? So what are the causes of plagiarism? Let me give you three examples of times I've encountered plagiarism. And they're not the only ways that reasons why students plagiarize, but it's important to be aware of them so you can avoid them. So first of all, one is just not being organized. So for example, there was a student who was not very careful when she took notes and then just her notes followed a book very closely and then she just used that as like her paper. Just basically copied and pasted her notes, made them grammatical, and did not make it clear what she was doing. Now she did cite the book, but pages and pages of her paper were just the summaries of this book, following the author's structure exactly. Just changing the words. That's plagiarism. And that can easily happen too, just by not taking careful notes. Right by not having your notes organized properly. If you have notes where it's not clear where your words begin and where the author's words are, if you have written notes that are separate from the book that inspired you, it's easy to forget, oh, I got those ideas from this book. Or I got those ideas from this author. So it's very important that when you take notes that you be organized and it's clear where those notes came from and that when you write your paper, you're clear where you got that information from and that your paper is not simply just basically copying off of what other people have done. Another example is panic. I think this is a big time uh, reason why people plagiarize, probably the most important main reason they plagiarize Simon's due tomorrow. You haven't done it. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Someone panics and just copies a Wikipedia article. That happens quite a bit, unfortunately. There are basically two ways to deal with this. One is just not to put things off. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times what people do is they procrastinate, they procrastinate, they procrastinate until they panic. And then, you know, they just decide, well, I'm just going to do this. So the, the big, I'm just going to plagiarize. The major thing is don't, do this. Don't procrastinate. Get on top of things. Do the work on time. If it's too late for that, please talk to me. It's much better to take the late penalty than it is to plagiarize. Usually, professors just have a late penalty. Why take the chance of getting a zero, ruining your academic uh, reputation, instead of just taking a late penalty? The third example are what I would call lazy sponges. Right now, uh, uh, Squidward there is being lazy. SpongeBob isn't. But this, I think, is a better slide to illustrate what I mean. Right? Lazy students be like, send me your answers. I just want to compare. And I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Is frequently you have a case of a very hardworking student and then a student who is lazy saying, hey, I uh, didn't do my work basically because I'm lazy. Um, can I see your ass assignment so I can copy it? 
And uh, this is really easy to catch. I catch it a lot, unfortunately. And it's always like a really good student with a bad student. And I just want to stress, both those are cases of plagiarism. They're academic dishonesty. It's cheating. Um, don't do it. If someone asks you to do it, you're, I want to stress you're not doing them a favor by letting them do this. You're just letting them use you. They're going to continue to use you. Obviously, if they do this to you, they don't care about you. They just are lazy and they're just bringing you down. I hate to say that, but you don't want people like that in your life anyway. So just tell them no, take the late penalty. But this is key, right? Be hardworking. If this, if you're the kind of person who does this, no excuses. People will um, try and make all kinds of excuses why they're not lazy or why they're not really plagiarizers, why they're not really cheaters. No, if you cheat, you're a cheater. Um, just do the work. Don't bring other people down. If you mess up and you don't do the work, take responsibility. Like I said, usually your professors, uh, it depends on the class. Usually I'm fairly lenient in late penalties. I'd rather have you talk to me and we can deal with the situation together rather than have you plagiarize or bring someone else into it and possibly get them in trouble as well. Now, I think I need to say a little bit about a famous case of plagiarism just to show you how this can be a big issue. And um, there's a very fascinating book called Tyranny of the Weak by Charles K. Armstrong. This man here, a fascinating book called North Korea in the World, 1950 to 1992, written by, say, Charles Armstrong, a professor at Columbia University, which is a very important, very prestigious university, has a really good Korean studies program. So this is all good stuff, at least at first glance. And I had the, our library purchase this book, and I remember reading it, and I loved it, because it told us something about North Korea. And North Korea is a country it's very hard to find information about. And what Armstrong claimed to be doing, which was brilliant, was to be looking at the diplomatic records of Eastern European countries who had people stationed in North Korea between 1950 and 1992. Right? Eastern European countries were primarily communist. North Korea was officially communist then. Not really communist anymore, if it ever was. At least it was officially communist during this time period. And the, those foreign diplomats left left historical records that tell us something about North Korea. So it was awesome. Fascinating book. Loved reading it. Like I said, had our library purchase it, and I encourage students to read it. An article was posted in Inside it, Higher Education. I'll just read it to you, and I'll come explain a little bit more what it means later about this book. Uh, Sla I, I feel, I apologize, this is a Hungarian scholar. I can't pronounce his name properly. Salantai said via email at the time that many factual details in Armstrong's 2013 book, published by Cornell University Press, that's this book here, and that's Armstrong, um, looked a lot like those from his own 2006 book, Kim Il-sung in the Khrushchev era, Soviet DPRK relations, and the roots of North Korean despotism, 1953 to 1964, from Stanford University Press. And while Salant Salantai checked Armstrong's site of Russian and East German archival sources, he said he found that many of those documents didn't exist. Armstrong's claims were often compatible with the content of documents that did exist, he also alleged. And I want to point out, Inside Higher Education is like the main source of information for academics. It's a very important um, journal, online journal, I should say. So to continue... Since the date, type, and content of the side documents were nearly always identical with an analogous Hungarian documents I cited, Salanti said then, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that these non-existent sources were fabricated with the aim of concealing the multiple acts of intentional plagiarism. And I gave you the website if you want to look at the whole, whole article. But basically what Cezlanti is trying to argue, and I think he's right, and I've heard him interviewed, and I, I, we'll talk more about this shortly, he's, I think he's completely correct, is that Armstrong took insights, things that Cezlanti figured out, and put them in his book, but in order to claim that they were his own, he made up sources in his footnotes that he claimed came from Eastern European or Russian sources, or I'm sorry, East German or Russian sources, and that he just made up sources that didn't exist to hide the fact that he was actually borrowing um, from Salonitai's arguments um, based on Hung Hungarian documents. Now you may say, why would you do that? Why not just give Salonitai credit? And basically, it would seem Armstrong wanted to make his arguments look more innovative than they really were. If he gives Salantai credit, then he's just borrowing Salantai's ideas. He's not a, a great innovative scholar. But if he's the one that figures out everything first, 
then he's a brilliant scholar and everyone loves him. And I want to stress, when this book came out, there were all these book talks. I mean, this was huge news, right? Uh, there was all these, uh, I think he, this was covered in like television programs, things like that. This was big news, at least for Korean studies. This was huge. It wouldn't be as big if it wasn't making claims to have done something new. If it said, well, a lot of this is based on Solantani's work. It wouldn't be as big of a deal. And what's further frustrating before Solantai is that this actually helped Armstrong's plagiarism actually helped him get tenure and promotion at Columbia. So not only did he not get Solantai credit, he profited immensely from stealing Solantai's ideas. Now, Armstrong... And this is, I mean, this is kind of a sad thing, and I, I'm just going to tell you this because this is unfortunately how academia works. Armstrong no longer works at Columbia. Um, however, he wasn't like fired. He basically just went on sabbatical for a year, got to keep his salary, and then retired. So he basically got to like work for about a year or do no work for a year and then get paid for it. I mean, that's a pretty good deal, right? <laughs> In a sense. I mean, you do something really wrong and you're not, punish that harshly for it. And Solantai, um, a lot of scholars said, well, Solantai did a lot of work. He suffered from this. Shouldn't he be paid? Shouldn't he receive damages? And to my knowledge, uh, to this day, Solantai has received nothing for the damage he suffered from this plagiarism. Supposedly, this book was supposed to be pulled. I actually called, I, I did something I never thought I would do. I contacted Lander University's library and asked them to pull this book. Because I said, I, I can't good conscience allow this book to be in our library. And librarians were like, oh yeah, we're definitely pulling that. You can still buy this book on, on Amazon. They apparently are still publishing it and printing it. Even though it has these serious issues with it. But in a sense, this points to an issue of power. Solantai is relatively weak. Armstrong is from a powerful university. And so the punishment wasn't that harsh in many respects, right? Um, I mean, he did lose his job, but he was allowed to retire. He wasn't fired. Armstrong, that is. So to read this, um, in November 2016, um, this is from an article that published by Columbia Newspaper, uh, connected to the university, Professor Bala Salantai of Korea University filed a formal complaint to Columbia alleging that Armstrong's books included 76 cases of academic misconduct. In 2017, Salantai discovered a number of additional problems in the work, raising the total number of cases to, to 98. So Armstrong plagiarized 98 times in his book. In 2017, Professor of East Asian Studies at Oberlin College, Sheila Miyoshi Yeager, remember her? She was the woman who uh, uh, former President Obama proposed to. Uh, before he married Michelle Obama, um, publicly resigned from the advisory board of the Wilson Center's Hyundai Motor Korea Foundation Center for Korean History and Public Policy in protests of Armstrong's actions. So why did I include this? One sad thing about academia is just like everything else, there's power relations that are important. So one thing I want to stress, Sheila Miyoshi Yeager, this is why I have a lot of respect for this, this scholar, she said, this is really wrong what Armstrong did. I'm going to resign from this important advisory board, which was, in a sense, funded in part by Hyundai and the Korea Foundation, which is very important. So she's really putting her money where her mouth is and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with this while this is going on. Now, here's the thing. Charles Armstrong was an American, or is an American, working at a prestigious... American University. Balas Salantai was a Hungar is a Hungarian a country that's not as powerful as the United States. And Korea University is a great university. My advisor when I was in Korea was actually at Korea University. Awesome university, nothing against it, but it's not Columbia. Right? It's not as powerful, it's not as prestigious as Columbia. So it's really sad. Salantai, because I believe of his nationality, because he was not based in the United States, he was a university that's not as powerful as Columbia, it seems like Armstrong, he maybe didn't consciously think it, but there was this idea, this guy's not that powerful, he's not that important, 
Great scholar, by the way. I read his book. I've listened to him talk. Solanta is amazing. But he's not as powerful. I can just kind of take advantage of this. Right? He What, what can he do? And Solanta worked very hard to prove that Armstrong was plagiarized and received nothing financial for his hard work. He did finally was exonerated. Or I shouldn't say exonerated. Finally, he was given the recognition he deserves. But unfortunately, this shows the kind of power relations in the world that even infects academia, right? We scholars are supposed to be all about the pursuit of truth, but you can see that we are frail human beings. You probably already know that because you, you know, you've heard me teach, right? You know, I'm a frail human being. Um, but the key thing is we're supposed to be all about morality and about truth and so forth. And unfortunately, that failed here. And um, someone more powerful thought they could take advantage of someone less powerful. And... Uh, like I say, at least uh, Miyoshi Yeager, Sheila Miyoshi Yeager kind of stood up and did some great things there. And eventually things did come to right, though, you know, maybe not as well as they should have. But like I said, I heard Bilal Salante talk, and he seems to be happy that at least the injustice he suffered has been recognized and his contribution to history will be recognized. And um, I hope he continues his work because the guy does amazing stuff. But the key point here is no excuses. Don't plagiarize. It is a serious academic offense. It is essentially an act of injustice. It's le it's like lying and theft mixed together because you're taking someone else's ideas and presenting them as your own. It's not what real scholars do. Certainly should not do it. There's no excuse. You know what it is. Don't do it.